Thank you, Gemma, for that introduction. Happy Friday. Has it been wonderful? Just want to take a quick moment to thank Ms. Sarah Gaetano, Keith the Stephanus, the volunteer team, Clinton Central School for making this possible. Thank you so much. It's really been a great evening out. And now, of course, it's Friday night, and I am the only thing stopping you from that well-deserved weekend of yours. And I have to be honest, I've been thinking about torturing you. <laughs> but I know that with great power, such as I now wield, comes great responsibility. Actually, that's going to be a theme that we're going to come back to tonight, especially given the fact that this exact group of people will never get an opportunity to gather together in this exact same way ever again in human history. And you might be saying, thank God. But I think it's our opportunity to write our own paragraph and enter that into what I call the story of stories. So let's end strong, stick the landing. Are you with me? All right. Let's do it. OK, so to start off, I'm going to survey the audience briefly. How many among us, since we're in a school after all, how many among us are teachers? See show of hands? Yes. All right. Hey, now. Thank you for your service. Uh, no small feat being a teacher. And they don't always roll out the red, um, the red carpet for you in America. But maybe after this conference, that'll start to change a little bit. How many among you then, since we've seen about a tenth of the room are teachers, how much, how many of you are, uh, ever have been taught? <laughs> ever have been taught? Okay, that expands the pool considerably. Great. How many of you are, uh, you are current students? Okay, great. And uh, how many of you consider yourselves students for life? All right. I also place myself in that final category. In fact, like many of you, I've always wanted to have the reading life of my dreams. And tonight, I want to present you with a very simple conceptual framework so that you too can have the reading life of your dreams, no matter if you're in school or far out of school, no matter if you're currently a student or if you're a teacher or if, like me, you are a lifer. When I got out of college, I asked myself a simple question. Okay, so what do I know? The answers did not materialize suddenly, by the way. I had to spend a few years thinking of that. But I knew, I knew that I yearned to be responsible for a body of knowledge and to find a mechanism in my life to continue to incorporate new fields of knowledge beyond my normal field of vision. And while I was doing that, to be able to deepen my relationship with the work that I already knew and loved. That, to me, would signal finding a reading life of my dreams. So right out of college, I immediately enrolled in two separate graduate programs, got in, gung ho, and found it, it really wasn't what I was looking for. And before I knew it, I dropped out of both of those programs. That began for me what ended up being a long apprenticeship. Most of my 20s, pretty grueling, a lot of high notes, a lot of book reviewing, a lot of waiting tables where I was looking to find what would this look like? What's the key insight that would help me find a reading life of my dreams? On top of which, this was the era of the advent of the 24 news cycle. There was a war in Iraq. It was the advent of Web 2.0. Facebook and YouTube were new among us. There was a lot claiming our attention. Lots of new voices. And this was a byproduct of success. But there are also trade-offs with such success, like living in an age of permanent distraction. To top it all off, we also live in a period of time which I think rightly is skeptical of a lot of the overarching narratives that we've inherited from past generations, and that makes sense. A lot of the one-size-fits-all explanations for how we got here no longer feel like a snug fit. And yet, we all want to be able to tell a story that's comprehensive, even cogent, about who we are, where we've come from, and where we're going. And if we can add some nuance into that, all the better. What I realized, my key insight, was that 
As you all know, it's become commonplace these days. We're a storytelling species. Many of the speakers who've already been up on the stage have addressed this topic. We experience the world and meaning, especially through narrative. This is even true in math class. You know, when some of you students out there sit for your state math tests, we're confronted with word problems, right? Why? Because they anchor that conundrum in a real life situation, and we can tell ourselves a story and apply it to our own lives. All of a sudden, we have an actionable purchase on what we're learning. Before we press play on the story of stories, let me provide you with a little bit of data to help ground us. In 1820, 200 years ago, this planet had roughly a billion people on it, give or take. And of that billion people, 12% of them could read. 12%. Fast forward to today, the adult population that can read has ballooned to 86%. It deserves a round of applause. It's a remarkable achievement. And we should remember that this was not preordained. This was not set in the stars. It could have gone differently. And in fact, for many other literate civilizations, it has gone differently. We only have to think of the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West that precipitated a period which we still refer to as the Dark Ages. So literacy has gone up exponentially as a percentage of global population. But I ask you, does it feel like the more literate society we're in? Does it feel like a society more suffused with wisdom? Does it feel like a society that excavates history and extracts its most wise and humane knowledge and then applies it to the life that we're living right now, it doesn't seem as familiar. Now, that's not to discount the many important social and political advancements that have been made. But, but when we talk about literacy, there's a really important distinction that needs to be made between basic literacy and what I'm going to call deep literacy, right? A qualitative difference between being able to write your name, again, no small achievement, and being able to scroll through and accept the terms and conditions when you download TikTok, qualitative distinction between that basic literacy and being able to sit alone with a novel by Toni Morrison or Gabriel Garcia Marquez or Jane Austen, and to be able to get from that deep reading experience a rich, and I would think of as a robust and multi-directional exchange. Right? Because deep reading is characterized by not only a depth relationship with the author and her narrative, but with the author and her narrative and her important precursors, whether they're intellectual, aesthetic, or otherwise. But not only that, we've got a depth relationship now with the author, with her work, with her important precursors, and with the community of readers around the world, not just in the present moment, but going back through time, who've left their life on reading culture, and that we are the proud inheritors of. And in that community of reading that stretches back across time and engages us in the present moment, there's a kind of eternal recurrence. An eternal recurrence, a kind of forever moment where these ideas can be tapped into like a river and shared. We turn off that tap, at our peril. We live in an age of generative AI. We're back in wars. We've had a global pandemic. We've got a lot of civic disharmony. Who knows who's going to be our political leaders in the next 10, 15 years? With great power comes great responsibility. Who among us will have the wisdom to wield these tools and to lead these important conversations which are ahead of us? If we don't have a relationship, with deep reading. I want to just say that a book, and this is some, something we often forget, a book is a piece of technology. And it's a unique piece of technology. It's a piece of technology designed for intimacy of expression and a kind of active engagement of the mind and the body. This is really important because it shows us that reading is actually a form of writing. 
Because when we read, we have to inscribe into that narrative our own vision, our own images, our own feelings, our own set of sensory responses, and that creates part of the community of book culture that we cherish, that we want to pass on to those who will come after us. So, in fact, it points to the fact that deep reading is connected with thinking and writing and speaking. And we're going to need people who can read and write and think and speak if we're not going to be permanently ensconced in an age of distraction. I'm going to close tonight with what I call the parable of the family vacation. So picture, if you will, a family with maybe some young children, and they've been scrimping and saving to go on a trip someplace fancy. Let's call it Paris, France. So they get the family on the plane, they get themselves to Paris, France, and they've got one afternoon allotted to visit the Louvre Museum, right? This is a treasure house of some of the world's greatest art objects, paintings, sculpture, silkscreen, you name it. And the dad in the group, with all the best of intentions, has a bucket list. He's got the greatest hits, and he wants to make sure everyone in the family sees all the greatest hits before they're there. They've got this one afternoon. They're in Paris, France. We've been saving up for this trip, and let's go do it, family. Let's, let's hit it, right? But as they start moving through these beautiful halls, they see that the, the five-year-old girl has just become immersed and entranced and ensconced in this abstract art that no one knows the name of, but something about the beautiful colors just pulls her in, and she's enraptured. But the father wants to get her to see the Mona Lisa and David and Venus to Milo and all the important things that we have to see when we're at the Louvre. But what's happening there is very, very special because that girl in that moment is developing a depth relationship with that piece of art. And what's special about that is that now she knows what a depth relationship feels like. And she's going to be able to port that over to wherever her curiosity leads her. The great thing about the story of stories is you can become a protagonist in global history. And once you become a main character in global history and imaginative literature, you can create depth relationships with any point of contact along the line, whether you're in school and learning curricula or whether you're out of school in search of information and wisdom. It'll be up to her and our daughters and sons to follow to create depth relationships so that they can figure out for themselves what the next chapter is that they want to write. Thank you so much.